Good Kitten Internet, uh, this is not a Let's Play video for Vendel Hearts, I'm just giving a plot synopsis up to now. We've reached episode 20 of the series, um, how many episodes am I going to have? One moment. Uh, yes, I was right, this is in fact the halfway point, so there are a total of 40 episodes of the series, sort of, I, with the Sega Saturn version, there's some bonus content at the end, so it's 40 episodes not counting the bonus content at the end. Uh, which I have no idea about whatsoever. We'll find out together. Anyway, um, the most important part, though, is that we have now been introduced to every antagonist of the game. There are no more hidden antagonists. We can now actually describe what's going on, because I'm sure, like, many of you probably don't understand what's going on, because I'm doing an episode every other day with gaps, because I'm really bad at timing. Anyway, um... So I thought I would talk to you about what's happened so far, what's going on, and the relations between the characters. Hopefully editor me, who's probably putting some type of snarky notice above my head right now, is putting in pictures and so on. That's the intent. I'm actually recording this with just my green screen. Uh, editor me can probably just show you green screen really fast. Yeah, so I'm not even cutting out the green screen of my recording. I'm having to do that in editing. So yeah, sorry, editor me. I gave you a lot of work. Anyway, so we started out Vandal Hearts as a squad of three people, member of the domestic security forces in Ishtaria, the Republic of Ishtaria specifically. Uh, Ash Lambert, who's the head of that squad, along with his two squad mates, Diego Renoir and Clint... I am forgetting Clint's last name, but Clint... Anyway, um, they're actually led by a commander by the name of Clive Beckett, who is just having them deal with, like, internal bandits and so on, where we met Zutgog, the Thief King, who got released from prison for some reason. Anyway, um, once we got to the capital st city of Shumeria, we found out that there was a riot in the Nobles Ghetto. Um, in this particular world... They went through a revolution um, not that long ago, within the past 20 years, and basically overthrew their kingdom and also all of the nobility. The nobility got treated like trash immediately afterward, and this is very reminiscent of the French Revolution, for reference. Um, effectively, the nobility got shoved into a closet, and they didn't actually resolve too many problems. Uh, instead, what they have are the um, anti-terrorism task force known as the Crimson Guard, led by a Kane Spites, who is Ash's rival. Kane and Ash really don't get along, and Kane's a dick. He also likes talking to you like this, always staring directly into your soul. <clears throat> anyway... Um, you go in, you mop up some things after the riot, which is apparently a bunch of ghosts and goblins for some reason. Ghouls and goblins? Eh, too bad they're actually ghosts. Anyway, um, you go in, you get the instigator, a count, to surrender, which is good news. Um, bad news is that... Ash loses, or Kane comes in and slaughters everybody else and takes the Count prisoner. Ash blows up, calls him a bastard, and they almost come to blows before Clive Beckett rushes in and goes, whoa, 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 same team, same team, hold on a moment. Even though we're totally not on the same team. Uh, unfortunately, Kane is very well connected. Kane's father is Hellspites, the defense minister, who the Crimson Guard work under and... Not the domestic security forces, apparently. So, apparently, in the Republic of Ishtaria, there's a separate terrorism task force along with a domestic security force. Anyway, um, blame gets thrown onto the domestic security force, and they are, quote-unquote, exiled. But a man by the name of Dolph Crowley comes in and goes, Look, I want you to do some sneaky stuff. You see, we have this general, General Magnus, who went off to an island and disappeared. We're not sure what's going on with him. We think he might have been leading a coup. I want the domestic security forces to secretly go off to that island. We don't want Hellspites to know what's going on in case of Hellspites is involved with this coup. 
So we're sent off. Um, we, in order to get to the island, we have to go through some ruins, and those ruins are guarded by a bunch of golems. It turns out those golems were summoned by a young prodigy mage by the name of Elanai. Elanai Dunbar. Magnus Dunbar's adopted daughter. Um, Elanai obviously believes that daddy could do no wrong. Uh, her tutor, Huxley, joins us along with Elanai to go off to Gilbaris Island to, in Elanai's words, prove her daddy's innocence, in Ash's words, to find out what's going on. We continue on, we end up picking up uh, Kira Wolfstad. Wolfgang? I don't remember her last name now. Wolf something. Anyway, uh, we pick up Kira along the way, who helped us out with some bandits, and eventually reached a port town where we needed to commission a ship to go off to Gilbaris Island. Turns out the island's cursed, and nobody really wants to go, especially since there's a pirate killing pretty much anybody that leaves the island. A uh, pirate by the name of Hassan. We find someone who's willing to take us as long as we can prove our might, which we did by defeating a local boss. Uh, that is Grog Drinkwater, the most appropriately named yet least appropriately named character ever. Uh, we go off toward Gilbaris Island. The pirate Hassan does in fact attack us, and we find out that Hassan is actually Grog's older brother. Um, Hassan dies, and is the first antagonist that we actually kill. They're dead. They're just nothing else to it. He did give a final moving speech about being sorry for his life and so on, but blah, 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 blah. Anyway, Gilbaris Island. We arrive to a village possessed. Um, we manage to defeat all of the statues possessing the villagers without killing any villagers, which was no small feat. And continue on into Gilbaris Island. We find out from the villagers that Magnus's troops are actually the ones that, or Magnus himself and his troops are the ones that possessed the islanders. Autofocus is getting weird. I wonder if there's like a fuzz in the way. Anyway, um, this points to Magnus being a bad guy. Um, Elanai doesn't want to believe it, but is still willing to continue. Uh, we run across three of Magnus's troops on word to the interior of the island where Magnus is gone. Uh, that would be Dolan. I don't remember his last name. Eamon and Sarah. Uh, Eamon's last name we have not actually seen in character. And I don't remember Sarah's last name either. I think that one's also one that we haven't seen. can't remember. Anyway, um, we meet the three of them. They are troops from General Dunbar who are running away. They manage to escape the camp. Yeah, the general's bad. The general has been converting all of his troops to man soldiers and kind of going a little nuts with power. Uh, ever since he picked up this magic stone of some variety. Elanai is saddened, but Eli does trust the other troops who, Elanai knows, they know each other, so it makes sense. Continuing on to the center of the island, we discover that the castle there is actually a remnant of an Ark, uh, specifically the Ark of Taroa, which is apparently a mistranslation in their language, where Ark, rather than being a giant boat, a la Noah's Ark, is actually a castle meant to protect things. Um, this is a part of the Holy Asha dynasty, which is the dynasty of kings that the Ish that the Republican of Ishtaria threw out, which means that their royal line might actually be true. They might have actually been telling the truth the entire time, which starts to throw shadow upon the revolution from Ishtaria, and it gets messy fast. Again, this is supposed to be reflective of the French Revolution in that, yeah, maybe not all of the royalty were that bad. They were bad. Anyway, um, we get up to Magnus and defeat Magnus, who reverts back to his original form for a bit, realizes what he has done, and starts filling in some information. It turns out that Magnus was sent there by Hellspites and Dolph. The entire thing was a setup to pin the coup that they are about to attempt on General Magnus rather than on... Right, pin it on General Magnus rather than General Magnus being the one that has the coup. And when they leave, they discover that Dolph and Hellspites were actually already there the entire time. Ash gives up because he knows he has absolutely no prayer of fighting them off and would brand everybody he's around a traitor and... Ash has some 
issues with the concept of being a traitor. Apparently his father was a traitor who betrayed the Republic in some way that has still not actually been said. We'll get to that later. Um, and basically they arrest people involved, namely the troops and Elanai and Huxley, I think. I don't remember if Ninja Master Hux was there or not. No, that's right. Um, basically arrest them and put them into camp. The rest of the party decides to go raid the camp over the cover of darkness. Uh, managed to get in, but unfortunately, not that would have mattered anyway. Let me introduce you to my beautiful young assistant. Yep. It seems as though they are betrayed by Kira. Kira has actually been working for Dolph this entire time. She is Dolph's spy. Uh, we get to see Kira in civilian clothes at this point, which is coincidentally exactly how she looks as a spearwoman, except with a spear and some wings. Um, and everything goes straight to hell at this point, because um, they take the magic stone away from the general, and Dolph starts trying to use the magic stone. The general still seems to have some of the magic stone's power and resists, the two of their fighting combined creates a rip in time and space, which suck in Ash, Grog, and Sarah. They are sucked into time and space and disappear. Oh, and the general. Forgot to mention General Dunbar. General Dunbar dies in this strange place that is a time beyond time. We discover a mage there by the name of Zohar who works with us to get us back to where we came from, or at least as close to as possible. When we arrive back, we find that we have arrived back three years in the future. We happen to arrive back at a place right next to where Clive Beckett is trying to make a final stand against Thief Lord Zootgog, who is now officially a member of the, um, not really the Crimson Guard, but mercenaries hired by the Crimson Guard. One moment. Sorry, getting notifications that I'm expecting a notification from work prospects. Anyway, um, so we arrive in and everything's gone to straight to hell. Hell decided rather than to pin a coup on General Dunbar because General Dunbar disappeared, decided that instead he would pin the attempted coup on Ash, who was conveniently not there to defend himself, and instead arrests Clint as the ringleader. Um, because General Denbar was a popular figure, he gets a national day of mourning and enough political clout to be able to have him rise up through the ranks, um, along with disgracing the member of the parliament that was the minister for internal security. So basically he gains a lot of power, eventually becomes prime minister, and then requests emergency powers from the Senate which were granted, and then he immediately dissolved the Senate, because screw them, and became an emperor. Then crushed the rebellion. Some people are being held for trial, uh, namely, that is, Clint, Elanai, Eamon, and also this random guy that was just caught for stealing by the name of Darius. The rest of the party, after killing Zootgog, he is dead, he is not coming back, don't worry. We are, in fact, killing villains in this game. Go and start forming this plan to not only free Clint and Sarah, or Clint and Eamon and uh, Elanai, but also storming the best, I mean, um, storming the prison as a symbol of, hey, look, the resistance is real and we're going to fight back. They succeed although the prison escape was compounded by, well, not really compounded. Uh, the prison escape was helped by Kira, who has, we've been seeing, has been working with Dolph as a spy, but is seemingly double-crossed Dolph. You see, Kira and Clint seem to have feelings for each other, and Kira felt bad for Clint when she found out that Clint was going to be executed, basically dropped off the keys and went, your weapons are right next door, I've already unlocked it, Kaysia, um, please take me with you, is actually what Kira said, except that Clint didn't trust Kira and left her behind. Turns out this may have been a bad idea, and Kira has since been arrested. 
um, removed from service by Dolph and arrested. So may not have been the greatest plan. Anyway, uh, the, we break out of prison. We defeat the prison guard Dumas, or Dumas. I'm not sure, given that it's a French Revolution analog, and obviously the name is based off of Alexander Dumas. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. Anyway, we kill the prison warden with a relatively tough battle. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot. Along the way, we met up, or we've encountered one of the Crimson Guard leaders. There are apparently five Crimson Guard leaders, of which we only knew about one prior to now. That would be Kane Spites. Um, there's also Lando, who is an assassin, well known for absolutely nothing because she died without being able to make an attack because the AI script wouldn't let her actually do anything but run away. Not great storytelling there. Um, there's four other... Uh, there are a total of five leaders of the Crimson Guard. So we have Lando, who's now dead. Uh, Kane, who's our rival, and it's going to be a while before we kill him, obviously. We have Sabina, who is the archer leader. Uh, we have Dallas. Dallas is the armor leader. And we have Kurtz, who is the war master or monk leader. Uh, the monk leader is kind of a hybrid between caster and still able to punch people, just because casters are super weak in this game, I'm guessing. Anyway, all of the Crimson Guard leaders decided to attack us when we just left. That was the previous battle that you may have just watched, or watched a couple of days ago at least. Um, we defeated all of them, even though we weren't supposed to, and we will be seeing them again, for reference. But at this point of the story, we are heading off to try to get some information about the Royal Ring. It appears as though the Royal Ring is required to turn the Magic Stone into the Flames of Judgment, which is apparently this ancient mega weapon of some variety. Um, we actually don't know the details about how the Flames of Judgment currently work, but we know it's bad, and we also know that Hell wants them as a symbol, basically to go, look how powerful we are. We have this totally awesome super weapon. We're not going to use it, but maybe you should listen to us. It appears as though Dolph might have other plans because it's been said that Dolph is manipulating Hell in order to ignite the Flames of Judgment. And Dolph has a special sorcerer friend known as Zeno Calamini. Um, Zeno, who's a name I totally stole for my role-playing villain, um, no relation beyond the name for reference, Zeno seems to have plans as well that involve the Flames of Judgment being ignited, but we don't actually have any detail beyond that. That's effectively the plot synopsis right now. So Ash and the party are, one, leading a revolution against the, re the uh, former Republican, now Empire of Astaria, and two, attempting to find the Royal Ring in order to control the Flames of Judgment. Hell is, who is related with the Crimson Guard and is effectively leading the Crimson Guard, is basically trying to consolidate control over his empire. He's invited another country in to try to take care of the rebels and their rebellion, giving away that part of Ishtaria just because he doesn't want it. And effectively just trying to consolidate power under him so he has power. He wants power for power's sake. Then we also have Dolph, who is nominally working with Hell, but apparently has his own motive. Uh, Dolph has the support of a sorcerer by the name of Zeno Calamani, who we don't really know much about right now, other than the fact that he can teleport back and forth and is apparently capable of scrying on Kira. That's a good plot synopsis, so hope that's cleared things up. If you have any questions about the plot up to this point, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. Um, it's strange to have a strategy RPG with such a deep plot. I know it's not necessarily the deepest in the world, but consider this is 1996. This predates Final Fantasy Tactics, even. This is the first strat RPG that I know about with a relatively good plot, even if it doesn't pass Bechdel. Anyway, talk to you later, Nat. Bye!